Katie, I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, I've been part of the TED community now for a little over 10 years. Uh, and TED Met, it, it, it's my favorite week. And we get to come here with these inquiring minds, these accomplished people, and they're all so happy to meet you. And I'm so happy that you all get a chance to meet a very dear friend, and I think one of the nation's finest civil surgeons, so, so, civil servants. Right. So let's start off by welcoming her and giving her a very special welcome. Thank you. It gets harder from here now. Right. <laughs> uh, because there, there's 1,800 people here who have 1,800 personal issues, and they submitted over 100 questions and I've chosen about a dozen of them. If we're lucky, we'll get through about 10 of them in the 20 minutes that we have. M most people don't know, as well as they think they know the FDA, they don't know how pervasive it is. And they don't understand that really 20 cents of every dollar that an American consumer spends, you regulate. And how far-reaching your job is and how much it changes. So I, I thought we'd start off by saying, at uh, TED Med 2012, it seems like the halls are alive with the sound of innovation. It seems everybody has an idea that might be the next penicillin, that might be the next life-saving cancer treatment. How are you going to balance your regulatory responsibilities with the need to help move these innovative products through the pipeline? How can regulation and innovation best coexist in the 21st century? Well, that is our highest priority. We are responsible for promoting and protecting the health of the American people, but we're also responsible for making sure that all of the opportunities that exist in science and technology today actually can be translated into real-world products that people need and count on and expect. And it is a challenge, but I think that, that working together, the scientific community, industry, academia, and government, and with that as our goal, we can make a real difference. Smart regulation really matters. It can, you know, for one thing, level the playing field amongst um, sponsors of innovative products and ideas. It can help clarify a pathway for bringing the necessary data and evidence about the safety and efficacy of a product. It can hopefully improve the quality and the utility of that product. And it can really ensure trust and confidence in that product, which matters to patients and consumers, it matters to healthcare providers, uh, it matters to the sponsors of those products. Um, so, you know, we are really trying hard to recognize that we have to find ways to work closely with the scientific community and with innovators to move those products to the people that need them. And, and to move that uh, approval process a little bit faster. I, I think that um, everybody here it seems like they have a drug or a device that's in front of the FDA right now. And uh, according to a study uh, released in uh, February by uh, uh, California Healthcare and BCG, uh, the FDA approval time for at least for devices and for some drugs has begun taking considerably longer. Um, over the last six or seven years, it seems like it's taken 75% longer. Or that's what people think. Well, yeah. What's the truth? Well, let me address that because there are a lot of myths. Um, drugs and devices are, are very different. The regulatory pathways are different and the process of innovation is different as well. On the drug side, we have made enormous strides forward in recent decades to improve the drug review time. We lead the world in terms of, of first to the marketplace on, on the majority of drugs. Um, that are reviewed and, and in the time of that review process, and numerous studies document that. On devices, it's a little more complica complicated. Um, for the majority of devices that we review, we are as fast or faster than our uh, European colleagues, for example. We're frequently compared to them, for better or for worse. For the ones that require what we call pre-market approval, 
we are a bit slower, um, sometimes significantly slower. Um, and we're working hard to streamline and make as efficient as possible our regulatory pathways. But we also have different regulatory requirements, and I think that's important to recognize, and I think it does matter. We have an efficacy standard. If you look at, at Europe, um, they don't have that same standard, and that matters for patients, it matters for healthcare providers, it matters for payers as well. And, and so I think that that's important. That doesn't mean that we cannot do better and we're committed to doing better in terms of review times. And actually, the, the trends in terms of the slowing of review date back to about 2002. But 2011 was the first year that we started to see it turning around and we expect to do even better in 2012 because we've made a very targeted effort to look at, at our processes and how can we streamline them? How can we make them more efficient? How can we make them more transparent and, and um, consistent and predictable? And along with that, we're really working to better understand how the world looks on the other side, because that matters too. Because a lot of people that are working within FDA don't really understand the the process both of innovation and the process of uh, trying to develop and run a business. And I think that, that we've identified by bringing some entrepreneurs into the walls of the FDA and spending more time reaching out and talking to CEOs and entrepreneurs as well, we've learned a lot that I think is going to continue to improve how we do business. So we, we're, we're, pushing, we're pushing hard. We have, we have room to go, but I think we're, we're really making great strides forward. And, and of course, the other side, uh, on the one side, it's uh, getting approvals quickly. On the other side, it's safety. Other countries uh, in this global regulatory environment may m move things through the pipeline more quickly, but the other side of the equation is how careful are they? Um, as drug development has moved offshore, so have safety trials. And there are dozens of national regulatory and approval agencies which are your counterparts. Um, what does the FDA do to assure consistency across all these different regulatory agencies? And are there holes in that global regulatory yeah. network that you'd like to have filled? Well, the challenges of globalization for us are immense, and they involve both the scientific enterprise and how do we deal with data that's being collected through studies done all around the world, um, but also the fact that products that we regulate are coming from facilities, manufacturers, producers all over the world, and we've seen just an explosion now um, because of, of globalization that's requiring us to totally do business differently. Um, we are working much more closely with, with sister regulatory authorities, sharing information um, and collaborating on, on activities, also working with international organizations to try to harmonize standards. We're also trying to, to really share the workload in terms of all of these facilities around the world. We actually have products that come before us that are being made in, in some 300,000 plus facilities around the world. It's startling. Drugs that we take here, 40% of them are actually manufactured in another country, and 80% of the active pharmaceutical ingredients in drugs that we take are manufactured elsewhere. Um, so we, we have just an enormous challenge, and that's just on the drug side. Devices, about 50% of devices used here are made elsewhere, and on the food side, about 40% of fresh uh, fruit and nuts come from other countries, and about 80% of seafood. Uh, so, so we have to be everywhere at once, and it means new partnerships working with both industry and other regulatory authorities um, so that you know, we can begin to have a presence um, and, and really fulfill our, our critical mission to protect and promote safety and health. And, and speaking about protecting. Uh, one of the most common questions that I received in preparing for this is, it's not just about globalization, but what about counterfeit drugs? How yeah. big is the problem, really? What are the numbers? Yeah. W what are you doing? Well, about one it? of the th issues is that we don't really know what the numbers are. We have not adequately studied this um, as a nation or as a global 
uh, scientific community. I think we need to do more surveillance and we really need to better understand it. But we, we know that the problem is severe. It's more severe in many developing economies. Some studies have even suggested that, that as much as 30 to 50 percent of drugs for critical medical conditions in some parts of the world may be substandard or truly counterfeit. Every year in recent times, the FDA has been investigating between 50 and 70 criminal cases involving counterfeits. Many of you may know that right now um, we're involved with investigating um, the counterfeiting of a, a very important cancer drug, Avastin. And of course, the internet has completely changed um, how we have to think about this problem because now it's not just what gets into the supply chain and might get into the healthcare system, but it's also the ability to access drugs, which can be very, very important and is encouraged in many sectors to get drugs through legitimate pharmacies online. But a lot of those pharmacies online, in fact, are not legitimate and the product that you get may not help you at all and may, in fact, be harmful. So again, that's a, a national problem and it's an international problem and it's one that we are deeply involved with. And, and one of the reasons for uh, there being such a desire to make counterfeits is because uh, demand so far exceeds supply. And in particularly, in, in some cases uh, re recently, there have been many publicized cases of shortages of, of certain cancer-fighting drugs, among others. Obviously, this is very serious. How bad is the problem of drug shortages in this area, and what can the FDA do, yeah. and what are you doing to Well, the drug shortages? shortage problem is one that has been increasing in recent years in a way that has really um, worried all of us. And any of you that are working in the world of healthcare, I'm sure have felt it directly. Critical drugs for the treatment of cancer, anesthesia drugs, pain medications, um, drugs for emergency care, a whole span of critical drugs. The majority of the shortages that we're seeing involve um, sterile injectable drugs. Many are generic products. Many are, are quite old drugs, but one of the, the, the common features is that, that these sterile injectables are hard to make, and because they're older, the manufacturing equipment is starting to age out. We do see a lot of quality problems. Um, there are problems with supply chain, and there are economic forces at play in terms of, of consolidation and, and issues around return on investment that have made some drug manufacturers get out of the business. So all these things are coming together for this increase in drug shortages. And what the FDA can do is, especially the earlier we hear about a drug shortage or a possible disruption in drug supply, we can work with the manufacturer if it's a quality issue to try to make sure that the drug can remain available. We can identify other manufacturers and help them to scale up to meet uh, a shortage demand. We can identify other manufacturers who aren't making that drug but could and expedite um, their ability to get online making that drug. And sometimes we go overseas and we look for um, an equivalent drug that may not be FDA approved but can meet our standards and we can bring it in for this targeted do, use. Do you have a mechanism uh, that you could tell people that if doctors here know about drug shortages, they can contact you as a We hotline? do, and we strongly encourage um, reporting of, of shortages uh, to the FDA. And actually, one of the things that happened recently, President Obama uh, took the lead on this, but reached out to drug manufacturers um, all across the country and around the world that supply important drugs to the United States and, and asked that they um, give us early warning when they might be facing a shortage situation. The law says you only have to report if you make a medically significant drug and you're planning to discontinue manufacture. But we said, go beyond what the law requires and just let us know. And we've actually seen since that time, which was the end of October, a six-fold increase in, um, in reporting about drug shortages. We've been able to respond very, very effectively. We've been, since that time, able to prevent about 114 drug shortages. And actually, I just mm. read this morning in the Washington Post, so it must be true, um, that um, uh, it looks like this year, in the same time frame compared to last year, 
we've seen 50% fewer drug shortages. So that's a very encouraging sign, but I don't think it's time to, to be complacent. Yeah. Well, we also worry about drug shortages in the area of antibiotics, and um, we've worried about increasing drug resistance, superbugs. Uh, we look with concern at the pipeline for new classes of antibiotics, and I know mm -hmm. you've just recently made an announcement that uh, yeah. In 1973, uh, the FDA proposed banning penicillin and certain tetracyclines in livestock feed, at least in part because of your concern that they might help develop drug resistance. And then three weeks ago, uh, after almost 40 years, a federal court in Manhattan issued an order compelling the FDA to press forward with that process. So. I think you have an announcement. Well, actually, I mean, we all recognize that drug resistance is a huge public health problem, and it, it has been a personal concern of mine for, for many, many years. And I think that you know, there is compelling evidence that we have to be more aggressive in addressing the problem of drug resistance in human health and in animal husbandry. Um, in, in order to safeguard the antibiotics that we have. And of course, FDA also has an important role in making sure that, that there are new antibiotics in the pipeline and that they get out um, into the healthcare community for use. But we did announce today, um, I was gonna break news, but I was too late in the program. Um, but we did announce um, final guidance on the judicious use of um, antibiotics in in. Uh, animal husbandry and, and uh, animal food production. Um, that means not using antibiotics for growth promotion purposes and, and feed efficiency purposes, um, but working with the um, veterinary community, working with, with ranchers and farmers, um, working with consumers and public health groups to really make sure that we have judicious and appropriate use, having those antibiotics available to treat animals that are sick under the guidance of a veterinarian. Um, but, but, but when it's just for growth promotion and feed efficiency purposes, we need to, to husband those resources so that they can be preserved to treat human disease and animal disease. And I'm sure that we'll have a lot of follow-up right. questions that people can send to Ted Med, right, and right. we will get them to you. I'd like to shift topics, and uh, we have Tom here from CDC, and CDC, uh, we're going to talk about tobacco for a second. Um, uh, CDC estimates that uh, tobacco use is responsible for one in five deaths each year in the United States. Cancer, heart disease, stroke, lung disease. We keep thinking that we're winning the battle, Yet in the U.S., one in four high school students smoke cigarettes. Another 8% use smokeless tobacco. Numbers are getting worse. They're going in the wrong direction. Um, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act was signed two years ago. Gives you more authority. What is the FDA going to do differently now? Yeah. And is this an intergovernmental task that we have to face? What's in the future for us? Well, it's very exciting and important that the FDA was given this new authority two years ago, as you know, to regulate tobacco products. And not only has it given us um, the, the tools and, and the mandate to, to take on a series of important tasks, I think it has also helped to renew the national conversation about the devastation that, that tobacco products bring on, on health. And, and well-being in this country and, frankly, around the world. And it does remain um, the leading cause of preventable death in this country. We now have the authority um, to oversee the marketing, um, distribution, and manufacture of uh, tobacco products. We have a new center for tobacco, and we've been implementing um, the law, meeting every statutory deadline mm -hmm. to date. Um, we have done things that are really targeting trying to prevent the onset of use, especially by um, kids and young people, because we know if you start early, you're more likely to take on the habit for life with all of the um, consequent medical problems, and also to help people who are already smoking get the information that they need um, to stop 
Uh, we've done things, for example, like banning um, fruit and candy flavored cigarettes, restricting access of youth to tobacco products. Um, for the first time, tobacco manufacturers have to report to the FDA about the components of um, the products that they're making. I was stunned to learn that they're about, in an average cigarette, there are about 7,000 chemicals. Mm. We've tried to identify those that are um, of highest um, health concern. Um, and we'll be, be uh, getting that information and then communicating it in a user-friendly way to consumers so they can better understand. Um, we, are, we are taking enforcement actions against illegal sales. We've um, developed, as the law asked us to, graphic warning labels for cigarette packages, although at the present time um, that is being debated in the, the courts. Um, there's a whole host of of activities that are underway. We are working closely with the Centers for Disease Control. They have had for many years a fantastic laboratory um, studying um, cigarettes and tobacco products. In addition, of course, the kinds of, of smoking awareness and prevention campaigns like the very powerful one they just launched within recent weeks. Um, so we, we believe that um, as a government and as a, as a public health community, we're going to really be able to revitalize this important um, area of focus and start to see the numbers come down. I'm, I'm very mindful of the time. We have about uh, one and a half minutes. Um, Let's talk for a second, uh, and almost just about that, about personalized medicine. The promise okay. of personalized medicine is that we'll have genetic tests and other technologies that will specifically match the right therapy to the right individual. But that's exactly at odds with traditional strategies that the FDA has for testing treatments that work for thousands or millions of patients. How will the FDA ask for clinical trials for therapies that may be useful only for one individual. Well, we are very focused and supportive of personalized medicine, and we actually think that understanding that there are subpopulations of responders or subpopulations of individuals who will have unacceptable um, toxic side effects from certain drugs will really enable us actually to be more aggressive in our drug approvals um, because we'll be able to actually see the treatment benefits or the treatment risks by studying subpopulations and stratified populations as opposed to having effects that are washed out if you have a heterogeneous um, population that you're studying. So we think that number one, it's critically important to getting the best possible treatments to people and really making a difference um, in their medical care and in their lives. But we think that it also, while it demands some new ways of thinking about how to structure clinical trials, and we're doing some very exciting innovative clinical trial designs, you know, again, working with industry and with academia to help us um, develop some of these models, we think that it will really enable us to, to, to be much more effective at identifying which drugs work and for whom under what conditions, and, and, and that will make an enormous difference in and, medical and, care. And this is such an exciting topic that we need you to come back next year <laughs> All right. and talk about it. We, we've run out of time. Okay. Uh, there, there are uh, 200 more questions <laughs> that have come in. They're you all only really ask the easy ones. We want you to come back next year and every year and keep this conversation going. And I think I'd ask everybody to Tell Peggy, Dr. Hamburg, that you'd like to see her back next year and join me in giving her a big round. Thank you.